Thank you, everyone. We are in the third session of the course by Professor Lars Vintz. Thanks, Lars. And today we'll have the comments by Professor André Luiz Freire from the Catholic University, my colleague in studying jurisprudence also. So thank you, André, for being here. And let's, let's uh, start with Kelsen again, because you love Kelsen. This is <laughs> Kelsen's year in Brazil. Thank you, Lars. Um, so I hope you can hear me. So if, if I'm not loud enough, then please let me know and I, I can pick up the microphone. Um, so I'm going to talk about Kelsen today, but I hope at least that, that the perspective that you will be offered on Kelsen is a little bit different from the one that you may be familiar with already from your studies in jurisprudence. So what I'm going to do today is not to talk so much about Kelsen's legal theory, the pure theory of law. There will be a little bit on that um, in the lecture tomorrow. Uh, what I want to do today is to focus on Kelsen as a political theorist and as a theorist of democracy in particular. So really what I'm going to do is to present some key ideas from a book about democracy that Kelsen published in the 1920s. Um, the German title was Vom Wesen und Wert der Demokratie. Um, it's about the nature and the value of democracy. And I think that understanding the arguments, or some of the arguments at least, that are presented in this book is helpful for um, understanding why Kelsen thinks that constitutional guardianship, which is the overarching topic of these lectures, um, should be exercised by a constitutional court and not as Carl Schmidt claims by um, the head of the executive. So let us delve into Kelsen's theory of democracy. Um, so this lecture will present um, an outline of the theory. Um, these are the different issues that we will address. So first of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about how Kelsen adapted or how he started out from in his thinking about democracy from Rousseau's um, of democracy um, as laid out in Rousseau's famous book on the social contract, the contrat social. Um, the next topic to address will be what Kelsen had to say about the majority rule as a method of taking political decisions and why he thought that the majority rule is a good rule for taking political decisions, even though, of course, where decisions are taken by majority, there will always be some people who are outvoted and who will find themselves in the minority and who will not see their own ideas or their own preferences realized in the law that's being made. And so the question that we'll address here is, um, why should those who are outvoted, who are a minority, um, consider decisions taken by a majority as legitimate? as decisions they should accept and they should defer to. Um, so to, to fill out Kelsen's view about this question, we need to talk a little bit as well, that's the third topic, but Kelsen's conception of democratic equality, which I'll emphasize is very, very different from Karl Schmitz. And then finally, we are going to look at the implications for constitutional guardianship of Schmitz's ideas about democracy. So can everyone hear me? Is that loud enough? Good. Okay. So let us begin by. Okay. So let's begin by uh, taking a quick look at Rousseau. Um, Rousseau, in his book on the social contract, um, was perhaps the first theorist of democracy. And in the Weimar Republic in the 1920s, Many authors who, who talked about democracy were attracted to Rousseau's views um, because they thought of Rousseau as um, the most important, the key democratic theorist. And Kelsen was one of the authors who, who started thinking about democracy um, from Rousseau's view. So we have to say a few words about Rousseau's theory of democracy. So the first point I want to make about what he takes a democracy to be. So what is a democratic political system? And so for Rousseau, a democratic political system 
is a political system where laws are made by the people. So the key to democracy is that the power of legislation must be in the hands of the people. And so in Rousseau's conception of democracy, the power to legislate, the power to make general legal rules will be in the hands of a popular assembly that includes all of the adult members of a society. So the idea is in a democracy, um, people are subject only to laws in the creation of which they have a say or they participate. So people are going to be subject to the laws that they made for themselves. And because they are subject to the laws that they made for themselves and not to laws that have been made for them, they enjoy a higher degree of political freedom in a democracy than in any other political regime. So democracy for Rousseau is to be defended by appeal to the value of freedom. And Rousseau made very, very strong claims about the freedom-preserving character of democracy general will want. So what's the idea here? So put very simply, the idea is that um, there are certain interests in at least a sufficiently small state that Rousseau thought was the best um, home for democracy. There are certain interests that all citizens share. And the idea is that if decisions are taken by a majority vote, it's impossible for um, a party or a faction that contains less than a majority of the people to prevail and to put their own interests, their own partial preferences into the law. Laws that are approved by a majority of citizens must be laws, or so thought, that reflect a general or a shared interest. They are laws that are good or that are freedom preserving for all citizens. And that is why he thought people can remain as free as before in being subject to democratic law or unrealistic. And Kelsen indeed um, agreed with that. So how are laws made in a modern democracy? Well, the reality is very different from the picture that Rousseau painted, right? So laws are not directly made by the people in a popular assembly. Laws are usually made in parliaments, which are staffed with um, members of parliament, so elected representatives of the people. But these representatives, of course, they are members of political parties. They are usually subject to party discipline. Um, that is, they pursue the goals that are favored by the members and the voters of that particular political party, but not necessarily by um, the populace, um, the electorate as a whole. So it's possible for laws to be made through bargaining and coalition um, in which particular partial interests are elevated over the common interests of the people or in which contested ideological goals are pursued that a large number of members of society may reject. And it seems if that happens, then we cannot count on the laws expressing or reflecting a common, a shared interest of all citizens, a common good. And so Kelsen puts this point quite dramatically by um, saying that even in a democratic state, um, a citizen may find themselves subject to what he calls the torment of heteronomy. So the torment of heteronomy is just um, the pain of being um, subject to laws, which are coercively enforced, of course, which have been made by other people, by a majority to which you don't belong, and which do not reflect your own preferences or your own interests. Okay? And so of course, the obvious question that arises here is, well, if you are a member of um, a minority that's been outvoted, if the laws don't reflect your interests, I mean, why should you say that you're any better off here than you might be in a monarchy where a king makes the laws, right? Um, which may or may not overlap with your own interests. So it's no better to be oppressed by a democratic majority, apparently. So what does Kelsen have to say about that point? So his key idea is that 
the promise that Rousseau made that you can remain as free in a democracy as you were in a state of nature, this promise can be given a less ambitious reading than we find in Rousseau, a more modest interpretation. And Kelsen wants to argue that under this more modest interpretation, um, the promise that democracy is freedom preserving can still be defended or it can be made compatible with the realities of modern democracy. So um, a democracy will not ensure, it will not guarantee that all citizens are always governed by laws, the content of which they affirm. But Kelsen claims that a democracy can guarantee, unlike any other political regime, that at least a majority of people will be free in the sense that the laws will reflect their own political outlook. And so the claim is that democracy is more freedom preserving than any other political regime or any other method of lawmaking that might be adopted in a society. Good. So let's try to look at um, a number of different rules that a society might adopt for taking collective decisions or for making laws um, to understand Kelsen's point. So Kelsen himself offers this comparison in his book. Um, so consider first that we congregate, we try to live together in a political society, we think about how we should make laws that are binding on all, and perhaps the first option that will be suggested um, and that we may find attractive is to adopt what I call here a rule of continuing agreement. Okay. So a rule of continuing agreement, uh, I suppose, is sometimes used when, say, you and your friends decide what movie to watch in the cinema or what restaurant to go to to have dinner. So as people will just talk with each other um, and try to converge on one option that they all affirm because they all want to see that movie or they all want to have dinner in that restaurant and then they manage in that way to coordinate their actions and to embark on an evening together. But here the idea is that um, this rule of continuing agreement isn't really binding anyone. So if someone decided at a later stage that, oh no, I don't want to watch this movie, I've seen a bad review, I'm not going to come with you. Of course, they are free to defect from the agreement that has been made beforehand. So here, I guess, the idea is that people can act together only as long as everyone holds the same view about what should be done. And Kelsen claims that this rule isn't really a rule at all, it fails to create anything like a collective decision that's objectively binding on all, even on a person who may later change their mind. Okay? So we cannot organize a society on the basis of this rule of continuing agreement. It's just a recipe for anarchy as soon as people don't agree about everything. So how about we adopt another rule that's the rule of unanimity. So in this rule, I guess, a decision will be uh, taken as a decision that binds all of us on the condition that at a particular point in time everyone has agreed to one option. But then um, the rule becomes binding, later defection from the rule is no longer considered permissible. So if there is a rule of continuing agreement and if I have agreed but later come to change my mind about what should be done, I will still be bound. Okay, so I can become unbound, I guess, only on the condition that I convince every one of you that we should take a different decision, again, unanimously. But if I don't manage to convince all of you, if only one of you doesn't agree with me that we should change our decision, then the decision taken will stand. And of course, um, the drawback of this unanimity rule is that it's possible for us to take a decision at some point and then later for most of us to come to consider this decision to be misguided, but a very, very small minority of perhaps only one person who exercises a veto power can enslave all of us to the decision that we have taken in the past. So there's a potential that most of us will, in the end, be unfree because the decision we have taken may no longer 
um, align with the wishes of a large majority. Okay? And of course, um, a similar prospect arises in a rule of supermajority, where, say, we decide with a two-thirds majority, and our decision stands until um, a two-thirds majority um, agrees to revise it. So here again, um, a small minority, though not as small as in the rule of unanimity, can enslave the rest of us, even if most people want to bring about a change. And finally, trivially, of course, the same would hold in a political system where laws were made by um, an autocrat, a monarch, who holds sovereign legislative power in their personal hands, or perhaps in a system where laws are made by a small aristocracy. Good. So these rules are all problematic. Either they don't create a social order at all, or else they raise the prospect, the possibility that most people will find themselves um, in disagreement with the laws under which they have to live. Good. So now Kelsen points out that comparison with these other rules of political decision taking reveals uh, an interesting characteristic, a virtue of the majority rule. So the majority rule, of course, is the rule that um, a, a, a decisions taken by uh, a majority of us, 50 plus 1 percent, um, will bind all until a later simple majority decides to repeal or to change a decision that's been taken in the past. And so the majority rule, of course, unlike the rule of continuous agreement, it does guarantee that there is an objective will of the collective to which everyone is bound. So it's not a rule that creates a danger of anarchy or unresolved disagreement. Um, this, of course, it has in common with the other rules um, that I discussed. However, the virtue, the interesting feature of the majority rule is that it guarantees that at least a majority of people who are expected to obey the law will find their own wishes, their own preferences to be in alignment with the law. Okay? So suppose that we are living under the um, rule of an autocrat. So one person has the power to legislate for everyone else. So it may be that this autocrat is an unusually benevolent autocrat who listens to the pleas and the voice of the people. And it may be that they make laws that a large majority of people approve. Okay, So it's possible for there to be freedom in an autocracy, according to Kelsen, if an autocrat makes laws that most of the people approve. But of course, that's also the possibility in an autocracy that a sovereign will make laws that go against the grain of the wishes of most members of society. So there is no guarantee that many people or most people will enjoy freedom under the law. But in a system that's run by majority voting, there's a guarantee that a majority, perhaps a small majority, but a majority at least of members of society will find agreement between their own preferences, their own wishes, and the content of the law. And it's the fact that democracy can guarantee that most people will be free, that sets it apart from the other forms of legislation that we have discussed. Okay? And so, of course, what Kelsen wants to suggest now is that because we are interested in remaining as free as we can, um, living under the laws made by um, a legislator, which we need to, to coexist peacefully, we have a reason to adopt the majority rule as a rule of legislation. It is more freedom preserving than any other rule of collective decision, any other rule of lawmaking that could be adopted. Okay? And so that is how Kelsen reinterprets Rousseau. So he doesn't claim that there won't be anyone who is in a mi minority who will be outvoted, who will find themselves in opposition to the content of the law, but at least we can rest assured in a democracy that uses the majority rule that most people will be free. Okay? Good. Now, um, I'm sure that you will already have thought about objections that one might make to this view. So 
let me present you with um, two obvious questions about this basic argument. And so I should say that um, in this lecture, I will only address the first of these critical questions about Kelsen's argument. So I will say uh, something about the second of these critical questions in the lecture tomorrow, um, which will focus on um, the Kelsen-Schmidt debate on the guardian of the Constitution. So the first of the objections to Kelsen, of course, is that the fact that um, the majority will enjoy freedom under the majority rule doesn't give anyone who's a member of a minority any reason to think that they should accept the law as legitimate. Okay, so suppose that we've taken a decision by a majority vote. 51% um, of us have voted for a certain law that I think should not have been enacted um, and that I think is scandalous, obnoxious, that um, thwarts my preferences, my interests. And if such a law has been made, what does it matter to me that a majority of my fellow citizens are free in the sense that the law overlaps with their will? So that doesn't seem to give me a reason as a person who is unfree now as a result of the law that's been made to accept the law as legitimate, right? So again, why is it any better to be oppressed by a democratic majority than by um, an autocrat or an aristocracy. So Kelsen has to give us some reasons for why, if we are in the position of a minority voter, we should accept the rules that have been made by the majority as rules that we can accept, that we can regard as rules that have been made in our name and that we should follow. And I'll try to say more about this in the next part of this lecture. So let me just highlight the second question that I will address tomorrow. So the second obvious question about Kelsen's argument is um, whether this argument for the majority rule stands in conflict with um, Kelsen's defense of constitutionalism and constitutional review. So of course, as I pointed out already, um, Kelsen thinks that constitutional guardianship ought to be exercised by a constitutional court that enforces a constitution that may impose limits on the powers of a legislator. And of course, um, if, if that uh, system is created, then presumably judges on a constitutional court can annul laws that have been approved by the majority of the people or the majority of the people's representatives. And if that happens, then it seems that there could be laws um, that do not conform to the preferences of a majority. And that seems to thwart the promise that democracy will make us maximally free. And so we'll have to talk about this problem in the lecture tomorrow. So let me get started here on addressing the first question. So what reasons would I have in a democracy um, as an outvoted voter to consider laws that have been made by a majority to be legitimate. So I think that um, one can draw some materials from Kelsen's uh, book on democracy to answer this question. Um, and these are uh, materials that um, address not so much the value of freedom that Kelsen highlights in his defense of democracy, but rather the value of equality that Kelsen thinks needs to be brought into play as well in order to understand the value of democracy. So here is um, a brief extract from um, Kelsen's book on the nature and value of democracy, where he talks about the burden of an alien will that's imposed on someone by social order. So an alien will is just a will that doesn't agree with me, but that has the power to make laws which I am bound to observe. And he says, this is felt to be all the more stifling, the more immediately the primary feeling of one's own value expresses itself in the human being, in the rejection of any surplus value of the other, the person who is making laws that I'm expected to obey. 
the more strongly the experience of the person who is forced to obey when faced with the ruler, the commander, um, the more strongly he feels that he will say, I am a human being, he is a human being, just like myself, we are both equal. So whence derives his right to rule over me? So the claim here is that um, if we create a society, live together, we come into it as equals, with equal moral standing and equal claim to be recognized as participating in um, the power of legislation. So um, if someone presents um, a claim to rule over me, to make laws that I am bound, I will at first reject this and say, well, this person is no better than I am. Why should they have a right to give me commands that I have to obey? Good. And so Kelsen says, well, this negative and deeply anti-heroic idea puts itself in the service of the negative demand for freedom, and it's the synthesis of these two values that is characteristic of democracy. Okay, so what is he trying to say here? So he's trying to say here that if it's to be acceptable at all for anyone to be a member of a society subject to that society's laws, um, then society must be set up in a way, or its process of legislation must be set up in a way that honors or that respects the fundamental equality of all persons. Okay? And of course, there's a way in which democracy um, does that. So democracy involves everyone in the making of the rules to which they will be subject. And in doing that, it honors our moral equality. It agrees with the claim that's made here that there's no one who has a natural right or a natural entitlement to rule over anyone else. Good. And so it's um, Kelsen's attempt to spell out this idea in describing more uh, carefully, in more detail, how democratic procedures must be constructed that will help us to answer the question why, as members of an outvoted minority, we might have reason to accept decisions taken by a majority as legitimate. And so I think um, reading a bit between the lines in Kelsen's book, you can see that he uh, distinguishes a number of dimensions of democratic equality that he thinks um, a democratic system must honor and must implement in how political decisions are taken. Um, the first of these is that um, the system must be characterized by free and fair and inclusive political competition. The second, which is very important for him, is that um, there must be an openness of legal content to future revision um, as a result of the outcomes of free and fair political competition. And then finally, he also raises a, a suggestion that um, for democracy to work well, the society that's going to govern itself according to the majority rule must be characterized by a relative, but not by an absolute um, social homogeneity. And so we've talked about homogeneity a lot already in discussing Schmidt. And so we'll have to be quite careful here in, in um, looking at this aspect of Kelsen's view to discuss um, how his understanding of homogeneity differs from Schmidt's. Now, the general claim that I want to attribute to Kelsen is that he thinks that where, where these three dimensions of equality are realized or respected in how political decisions are taken, there, even those who are outvoted, who are for now at least members of a minority, um, have a good reason to regard the laws that have been made by a majority as legitimate. Not perhaps as good laws or as just laws, but as laws that they have reason to accept or to comply with. So um, another way of putting um, the outcome of this argument is that where these three dimensions of equality are expect, uh, respected, uh, people will form um, a demos, a people that's temporally extended. So you don't look at yourself as a member of a community just in the present, but in the present and the future. And you see yourself as someone, though you may be in a position of a minority right now, who could in the future be part of a governing majority um, so that your own wishes or preferences are aligned with the law. And it's this temporal perspective on the will of the people that reconciles you to the present um, oppression, if that's what you want to call it, 
by the will of the majority. So let me just go through these um, three points and explain them in a little bit more detail. So I said that democratic procedure um, of decision taking, it must honor the equality, the moral equality of all the members of society. And it does that by according to all the members of society equal and ideally, of course, equally effective rights of political participation. So this requires, for example, that laws must be enacted in a free and fair process of political competition. So um, there must be no tampering with the vote. Um, people must be able to cast their vote without being subject to any undue influence um, or without any pressure or coercion. And um, they must know that they will not be penalized or sanctioned in any way, of course, for um, the views that they express in the vote. Um, people must, of course, have a right to vote in the first place. And they must also be permitted to organize politically, to form political parties or associations that try to influence an electoral campaign and to win seats in a parliament. Um, and these different political groups or associations or factions, they must also be put into a position to compete on equal terms um, in the public sphere. So for instance, to have access to the media and to be given an opportunity to make themselves heard, again, without having to fear that they are going to be penalized or sanctioned in any way for the views that they express. So that is, I guess, um, a brief description of what in political science um, is considered to be free and fair political competition. And Kelsen clearly thought that this was an essential condition for democracy to work. And so here you can see that there's already something more than just the majority rule itself that's in play. Because of course you could have a system where decisions are taken by the majority rule, but for instance where people do not enjoy an unfettered right of political association or where they do not enjoy equal access to the public sphere to make their own political voice heard. Okay? So we are going beyond, at least to some extent, the mere rule of procedure itself here. Now, a further very, very important point is that for Kelsen, um, any decision that's taken in the present, or that's been taken in the past and that is still in force, it must be open um, to future revision. Now this is perhaps a simplification. So, so there's a, a thorny and difficult question about whether the rules that constitute a fair political process, whether they should be open to revision in such a way that perhaps democracy could be abolished democratically. Um, and as we'll see, so Kelsen um, uh, has a kind of resignative answer to this question that I will highlight at the end of my presentation. But let's leave that complication aside for now. So the general point is that when laws have been made, um, people who dislike those laws must have the right to advocate for the repeal or for the change of that legal content. So they must have the right, of course, to try to win a majority and then when they have a majority to make different laws that reflect their own view as to what the law ought to be. So the legislative process must be open to future legislative change that modifies the content of the current law. Um, people must know, in other words, that if, they, if their camp, their party was to win a majority in the future, they would be able, using their majority in parliament, um, to make the laws that they want to see made, or perhaps to repeal the laws that they dislike, or that clash with their preferences or interests, right? So if, if people didn't know that winning a majority in an election will give them that opportunity, they would have little reason to regard the laws that are now in place as legitimate because they are bearable. The torment of heteronomy they impose is bearable only because there is a hope that in the future these laws might come to be changed if we, our people, win a majority. If I was forever subject to the laws that are in place and that I dislike, um, elections would be an empty ritual. Okay? So perhaps to highlight here, um, there's a connection to the second question about Kelsen's defense of the majority rule that I talked about a few minutes ago. 
So of course, um, if you have a, a constitution that imposes limitations on the process of legislation, um, for instance, with a Bill of Rights, or if you have perhaps even eternity clauses in a constitution, then of course, um, this openness that I'm talking about here is going to be compromised to some degree at least, right? Um, and there's a question how that is compatible with Kelsen's claim that um, legislative content should be open to future revision. So just to highlight the problem again. Good. So the third, the third condition is relative social homogeneity. So here the idea is that even where the first two dimensions of equality are honored, so where there are equal and equally effective rights of political participation, um, so that uh, members of an outvoted minority um, know that should they win an election, um, they'd be able to change the law according to their preferences. So even where these two conditions are fulfilled, um, there's still a possibility that people might find themselves trapped um, in a situation where there is no hope that they will ever be able to be free under the law. So you might think of um, a society that is very, very deeply polarized along some axis of conflict. So one, one um, striking example is uh, Northern Ireland, where, as, as you may be aware, of course, um, the, the population is divided into Catholics and Protestants um, who, for historical reasons, are, are deeply inimical to one another. Um, and um, in that society, so I guess there's a demographic shift going on. So at some point, Catholics will be the majority, apparently, if demographic trends continue. But um, it used to be the case um, for, for as long as anyone can remember that um, the Catholics were a minority in Northern Ireland. Sorry, the, uh, yeah, the Catholics were a minority and the Protestants were a majority. And so the political parties align with these confessions. So there's a Catholic party, a Protestant party, and Protestants will always vote for the Protestant party. Catholics will always vote for the Catholic party. And it's fated um, that the Catholic party will always lose because the Catholic part of the population is a minority. So suppose you find yourself in a situation like this and you're a Catholic, then you will know that your own preferences will never be realized because your party will never win an election. So it may be that legally, um, if by some accident your party won, you would be able um, to implement your wishes. Okay? So there is no legal barrier to that. But as a matter of political fact, um, your party is never going to win due to these demographic structures of the society. So in that kind of situation, I suppose, um, again, elections from your point of view as a member of the minority would be an empty ritual. They would, they would never give you hope that your preferences might come to be realized in the law. And so I think Kelsen wants to argue that where, where society is divided in this way, um, democracy may not be meaningful. So the outvoted must have a real hope that their political camp might win a majority in the future. Okay? And this possibility for a political alternation requires a relative homogeneity of society. So it requires a social condition in which majorities can shift because there are some voters who are willing um, to switch from um, the two main parties from one to the other. And so this provides certain restrictions, I suppose, on the realizability of democracy that Kelsen um, is quite happy to acknowledge. So Kelsen is sometimes presented as this normativist or, or theorist concerned with ideological purity, um, who is far, far removed from practical political concerns. But that isn't really true. So Kelsen, um, as a political theorist, thought hard about the social conditions of functioning democracy. So here, I have a quote to illustrate that, which is taken from a book um, called Sozialismus und Staat. So it's a, a book in which Kelsen tries to defend um, democracy, liberal democracy, against authors in Austria at the time who argued for a dictatorship of the proletariat. 
And so here there's this um, short extract from this book. So Kelsen says, it is quite permissible, it's possible to reject the democratic form of state for a group of individuals who are separated by unbridgeable differences of interest. So the democratic form of state, he says, may not be suitable for a multitude of human beings who are connected only by the order of their state, but separated, as a matter of fact, by contradictions of language, race, and religion. But such a multitude ought not to be connected into the unity of one state to begin with. Okay. So what is he talking about here, as the picture is meant to suggest? Um, it seems he is talking obliquely about the Austro-Hungarian Empire, so the state that he was born in, that he grew up in, and that existed um, until the end of the First World War. So here you have a little map of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And what the map shows is that this was um, a multi-ethnic state, right? With a German part, a Czech part, a Slovak part, a Hungarian part, a Croatian part, a Bosnian part, a um, Serbian part, um, a Galician part, and so on and so forth. And these different ethnicities were united into one state only by the law, Kelsen says, um, by the constitution of that state, but the state was not a democracy, it was a constitutional monarchy. And of course, um, as a result of the First World War, the state broke up and the different parts were um, turned into independent nation states that were supposed to reflect the boundaries of the different ethnicities that you can see here. And so Kelsen seems to affirm here the idea that, well, perhaps it was to the good that this um, strange political entity was disaggregated because um, it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have been possible for all these different ethnicities, all these different peoples with different languages and religions and so on and so forth to coexist in one democratic state. Okay? So the, the empire was not homogenous enough for democracy, but perhaps some of its parts are. Okay? So perhaps if you want to um, create a democracy, it's, it's a good, a prudent maxim to try to make sure that um, the population contained within the borders of your state is reasonably homogenous. Okay? However, Kelsen rejects um, the claim that we've already discussed in discussing Carl Schmidt um, that really democracy can only work if a society is completely homogenized or if it is um, freed of all deep or profound um, political conflicts that might divide members of a society. So here is um, another passage from this book, Socialism and State, um, in which Kelsen argues that um, the conflict between capital and the proletariat, between um, employers and workers, um, though it is a very, very um, grave conflict and uh, a deep conflict, should be settled by democratic means. So he says it is, it is possible to reject democracy as well from the point of view of class struggle, but it would be meaningless to admit democracy only for a group united in solidarity, that is, for a multitude of individuals whose wills converge, since they are infused with a spirit of community with respect to all relations that need to be regulated by a communal order. Quite apart from the question whether such a group can even exist, we would not, in this case, have any need, Kelsen says, for a principle of majority. Okay. So here the suggestion is that, well, um, on the condition that there is relative social homogeneity, we should aim, we should try to resolve the remaining social conflicts, and most importantly, Kelsen thinks, the class conflict, by democratic means. So why should we aim to do that? We should aim to do that because um, the ideal of a society completely free of political conflict, of deep political disagreement, is an unrealistic fiction. There will never be such a society. So if any society has to deal with political conflict of some kind, then the question, the only question really that, that we have to answer is whether that conflict should be resolved autocratically by imposition of the views of a part on the whole, perhaps by way of coercive imposition of the views of a part on the whole, or whether we find a way um, to adjudicate these differences peacefully through a fair 
and open democratic process that gives even the losers a hope that perhaps in the future they will be able to attain their goals. So I suppose in concrete terms the idea is um, you should leave the decision on the question whether society ought to be capitalist um, or socialist to the democratic process. And whoever wins in that democratic contest should be seen to have the right the opportunity to realize their aims, but only on the condition of maintaining um, a majority in the democratic process. And that is a fair, but also a peaceful way um, to resolve this conflict, and the only fair and peaceful way, Kelsen thinks. Good. Um, so let me try to draw, um, or to outline a further conclusion, perhaps, that, that Kelsen um, thinks we should take from um, his reflections on relative homogeneity. Um, so the conclusion is that um, if you want to run a democracy, though, though perhaps as a matter of fact, you need relative homogeneity for the democracy to work well, um, you also have to be willing to take certain risks. So you have to, you have to take the risk of trusting um, in regard to the, to the disputes that are to be arbitrated democratically. You have to take the risk to trust your fellow citizens, perhaps fellow citizens who have different political views, that they will um, be willing to abide by um, the strictures or the requirements, the demands of political fairness in running the democratic system. So um, you will have to trust them that if they lose an election, they will step down and let you govern, right? just as they have to trust you that you will do the same. Um, and for democracy to work, um, there is no replacement for that trust. So if we go to a Schmittian idea of constitutional guardianship, someone might suggest, well, perhaps there should be the sovereign who can take a decision on the exception if the conditions of political, uh, fair political procedure, fair political competition are disrupted or are compromised. But of course, such an agent, a sovereign taking a decision on the exception, would not be a democratic agent themselves. They would have to act on behalf of one of the two political camps that compete with each other, right? So you cannot save democracy as fair political um, competition by introducing um, a Schmittian guardian of the Constitution. So the only option that you have is just to try to continue to have trust in democracy. Um, and Kelsen thinks that, um, of course, democracy may fail. It may be that too many people defect from a commitment to democracy as Kelsen understands it. But what you have to do as a Democrat is then just to, to continue to hold up your flag and to try to convince other people to remain Democrats, but, but not to resort to dictatorial measures in order to preserve it, because um, you cannot preserve democracy by any such means. So democracy is a risky political enterprise, but if it works, people can enjoy as much freedom as can be had under the pressure of coercively enforced laws. Good. So let me just try to loop back very quickly to draw a contrast here um, to how Schmidt understands democracy. So there's a sense in which Schmidt is also attracted to Rousseau. So he, he, he is attracted to Rousseau's idea that in a democracy, people remain as free as before. Um, but he thinks that, well, this promise can be kept only if people's views are truly unanimous, as Rousseau seems to have assumed them to be. Um, so the claim that Schmidt puts forward is that um, people can remain free um, only in a society that is absolutely homogenous and completely free of serious political conflict. And the idea is that if a society has been homogenized by the guardian of the Constitution um, to be absolutely unified in its political views, then all the people who are still included in it will enjoy the promise of freedom under the laws. Okay? But we've seen already, of course, um, that this comes with a dark um, flip side of the coin, namely that the people who are not considered to be members of the constituent subject are simply excluded from the, unanimi un the unanimity of the people as constituent power. 
so of course, this, this way of reading Rousseau's promise in Schmidt, it also colors his understanding of democratic equality. So in Kelsen, there's an understanding of democratic equality, as we have seen, I think, that appeals to the equality of human beings, the equality and moral status of all those who are human, who are members of a society, and who are expected to obey society's laws. Now, Schmidt doesn't agree with this understanding of democratic equality. He thinks that democratic equality is the sameness of all those who identify with the positive constitution, the markers of political identity that a constituent power determines to be the underpinning of the legal constitution. Okay? So that, for instance, as we have seen yesterday, um, people who are convinced socialists may not count as members of the German nation for Schmidt. And therefore, um, it would not be problematic if the Constitution was to make it impossible for them ever to prevail in a democratic election. So in fact, that's a part here of Schmidt's expressive conception of democracy. He thinks that the procedures that we associate it with democracy, so to vote for representatives in a parliament, the process of parliamentary lawmaking. Of course, these procedures are democratic only in a derivative sense. They are democratic only as long as they do not lead to outcomes that conflict with how the members of a people in the political sense understand their own identity. So what this means is that the polity must be absolutely homogenized before a formal, a legally organized democratic system can even begin to operate legitimately. So let me just construct um, a counterpoint by talking about Kelsen. Um, and, uh, I'm labeling here his conception of democracy as a constructive rather than an expressive conception. So Schmidt thinks that democracy expresses the pre-legal or the pre-constitutional identity of the people. Um, for Kelsen, um, the claim is that there is no will of the people um, in advance of the operation of democratic processes. So the will of the people is constructed in a democratic process that has the features we outlined earlier in this presentation. So um, in other words, uh, it, it would be democratically illegitimate um, for any part of society even a majority, um, to claim that it can stand in for the whole. And then, for instance, in an exercise of Schmittian constituent power to make a constitution that permanently excludes or um, disenfranchises the members of a minority. So all members of a society, all those who are expected to accept the law, to obey it, they must be integrated into a process of legislation that gives every group an equal chance to prevail. So the will of the people is the outcome of this process. Right? And it's the will of the people only because, um, as we have seen, the outcomes are always open to future revision as a result of further political competition. So in other words, um, the exchange between a majority and a minority and the alternation in power, as Kelsen says, is essential to democracy. And Schmidt is, is exactly wrong to claim that political competition as it takes place in a political system dominated by parties is um, a corruption of democracy. It is what we should consider democracy to be. Good, so this contrast being drawn, I'm uh, at the end of the presentation for today, and I have one slide left. Here we go. Um, that tries to draw some quick conclusions about constitutional guardianship, which, of course, um, is the overarching um, topic that um, we're trying to address. So let me just try to explain why um, this constructive conception of democracy is uh, wedded to the idea that constitutional guardianship ought to be exercised by a constitutional court and not, as Schmidt claims, by um, a political agency, by the head of the executive. So first of all, um, so, so Kelsen 
um, has a different view about what the object of protection is um, in constitutional guardianship. So we have seen that um, for Schmidt, the object of constitutional guardianship is the condition of social homogeneity or social normality that he thinks is a precondition for the applicability of legal norms. Um, and that is why guardianship must, must be a political or executive power, because these conditions cannot be safeguarded um, through legal decisions. But for Kelsen, of course, um, the constitution that is to be safeguarded is not the set of social preconditions of democracy. The constitution that is to be safeguarded is the legal constitution. It's the system of constitutional norms that organize um, the democratic political process in such a way as to make it compliant with the different dimensions of democratic equality that we discussed. Okay. Um, and it's because um, the object of protection is the legal constitution, which we assume is a democratic constitution, that um, it's up to a court um, to defend the constitution or to guard it. So the idea of constitutional guardianship in Schmidt is that um, even if you have a democratic constitution, of course, it may be that um, political disagreements may arise about whether the constitution has been honored or whether political processes truly were fair and compliant with democratic standards. And he thinks that um, the, main, the main job of a constitutional court is to act as a kind of referee of the democratic game and, and to make sure that the rules of the game of democratic competition are honored. And it seems obvious that if that's, the, if that's what constitutional guardianship is to accomplish, then it must be exercised by a court that has at least some degree of independence um, of the different political camps that may find themselves in disagreement. Good. And as I said already, um, Kelsen is quite hostile to the idea of democratic militancy. So he, he acknowledges that democracies may break down, but since democracy is based on the value of freedom and the value of equality, it doesn't make any sense to try to defend it by measures that, in effect, deny equality and freedom. So democracy, again, as I said, is an experiment. And we must hope that enough members of society agree with us that it's worth continuing so that our freedom, hopefully, will be preserved, um, not just in the present, but also in the future. So thank you very much. And then tomorrow on to um, the Kelsen Schmidt debate. Thank you, Lars. I will pass to André. If you spoke without microphone, I, I will do the same. So, thank you very much, Professor, for, for the lecture. I was, uh, Kelsen is, a, is an author that I admire, and I think this is more, in terms of legal uh, theory, the more coherent and more structured author that this theory is like that. But he's not so much studied in terms of political, in his political ideas, even here in South America that we study a lot, at Kelsen. And I was, uh, I have two, two questions, one very simple and uh, kind of speculation, is a kind of speculation. And why do you think that political ideas of Kelsen, Kelsen's political ideas are not so studied and debated as other ones? I think in common law countries, it's more uh, easy to respond that because even the legal theory of this is not that studied as hard or so working, etc. And my second one is I was thinking you, you, you told that um, in a rigid constitution, when we have some clauses that cannot change uh, in the legislative uh, process, uh, and we have here in Brazil such uh, this kind of clauses. Uh, for individual rights and, and fundamental rights, uh, separation of powers, the democratic uh, regime cannot change that. And this is some tension with the, the majority rule in Kelsen, but trying to, to maybe to 
not that friendly auto, but to, to provide an answer for that. Uh, you said as, as well that in, in, Kelsen's, in Kelsen's view, uh, certain homogeneity of the society is necessary to, to democratic uh, regime. Those these rules, those rules, these uh, multiple rules, could be the, the source of this homogeneity. For example, like here in Brazil, we are a very large state and with very different views about everything. And nowadays, every, everyone has a position about everything. <laughs> but, uh, could this uh, be the, the source of homogeneity in, in, in a uh, democratic state such as ours? So, so pluralistic in terms of values. But thank you. Yes, so, so I'm not sure I, I really have um, a good answer to the, um, to the first question, because it's, it's a puzzle to me as well, because I, I admire Kells, and, and I think his theories are extremely interesting. So I'm, I'm not sure why, why, why the political views have not found um, the attention they deserve. Um, so, so perhaps it may be that, that in the Anglo-American context, um, the explanation is simply that Kelsen, even Kelsen's legal theory was, was not really taken very seriously. And, and of course, um, a lot of the texts that go to his political works um, have only been translated very, very recently into English and thus become accessible to people in the English-speaking context. And, and that may be the reason why, why there's not been as much debate um, um, as one might expect. But um, there's actually an interesting trend in recent years in, in political science in, in the US that, that there are theorists of democracy who are quite interested in Kelsen's theory of, of democracy. And um, uh, for instance, um, the political scientist Nadia Obinati, who has written very extensively on, on populism, has used Kelsen's theory of democracy as, as a framework for analyzing populism. So there's now a um, uh, a greater visibility, at least in political science, of the theory of democracy in, in Kelsen. Um, I suppose in, in Germany, where I come from, perhaps the reason why Kelsen wasn't studied as much is that in, in the years after the Second World War, um, his views were overshadowed by, by the views of other authors who were still present in Germany. And, and of course, Kelsen had been forced to emigrate and was far away. And, um, uh, I didn't really have a voice in the post-war debate, and it's only in recent years that people in public law have, have returned to Kelsen's um, political theory, and, and I think there's now quite, quite a bit of debate um, among uh, people in public law in Germany about Kelsen's theory of democracy. So things are improving. And so for the Latin American context, I, uh, you, you know better what the answer to the question is than I do, so um, I wouldn't uh, venture to guess what the reason is. I don't know exactly because people uh, disagree a lot about the extent of this of these rights. For example, uh, human dignity. Uh, uh, we had some two great professors in the past that both defended the, the right to use arms based on human dignity, <laughs> or to to defend the, the, the use of arms, and or to prohibit the, the use of arms based on human dignity. So sometimes it's very, I think, quite. Uh, uh, not so clear for everyone what these rights are and etc. So I I was hoping that you could <laughs> lead this, the, the, put put light in this in this in this thing in order for us to to understand better mm -hmm. ourselves at the end of the day. Yeah. So I'm. So I think uh, all I can say perhaps is that um, I think Kelsen did have. Um, an understanding of human dignity. So, so he seems to, th so there's an idea of human dignity in, in one of the quotations I gave where someone says, well, I'm equal to everyone else, why should they rule over me? But, but Kelsen didn't really have a jurisprudence of, of dignity of, of the type that exists now. And of course, in, his, in, his, um, um, in some of his works, he was quite skeptical of, um, of um, including for example, references to values like dignity in a constitution, precisely because he feared that um, th these were too open-ended for, for judges to know what to do with them, with, with the possibility for widely divergent results in constitutional adjudication. And so his, I think his idea of a good constitution is one that, that protects democratic procedures, but that has otherwise 
quite slim in, in um, the values and rights to which it commits. Yeah. Maybe that's why we have so, uh, our Supreme Court, for example, uh, is in constant uh, fight against Congress nowadays because they try to, to extend too much some of the wordings of their own constitution and saying that some things mm -hmm. are permitted based on our constitution and Congress are not so we need to accept that. So nowadays we have we have this kind of discussions. So some some of the reasons why I asked that. Yes. So you had the second question though I haven't answered yet um, about uh, eternity clauses. So I mean I've. I've wondered about this myself, whether um, Kelsen's view could, could be made compatible with eternity clauses or with, with the idea that there must be limitations to constitutional amendment. And um, I don't think, as far as I'm aware, Kelsen himself gives um, any answer to that anywhere other than to say in passing that, oh yes, of course, technically it's possible to have a constitution with eternity clauses, but he just makes it as, as a legal technical point. He doesn't offer an evaluation of whether it would be a good idea to have eternity clauses or what they should contain. Um, now, I mean, thinking about his conception of democracy, perhaps, perhaps one could argue for eternity clauses as legitimate that protect um, the conception of democracy that he sets out, so that protect the, um, the openness, the fairness of the political process and um, the, the legal dimensions of equality, um, though not perhaps the, the homogeneity condition, because I don't think that Kelsen um, would have agreed that um, some picture of homogeneity should be enshrined in law with eternity clauses, because I think that would have restricted the openness of the democratic process too much for his understanding of democracy to work. So, so if there are legitimate limitations to amendment, they must be protections, I think, of, of the process of democratic decision taking, but, but they should not be material limitations. Okay. Uh, here, here we have this material limitations. Yes, yes. But he, he could say that this is the rule of the game, uh, to, to have this kind of material limitations, yeah. and therefore is justified by the democracy itself. Yes, I think it, it depends on, on what you take democracy to be. So um, I think in the last lecture, I'm going to talk a little bit about Dworkin's conception of democracy. And of course, Dworkin's conception of democracy has a richer understanding of dignity. And he thinks that respect for a material conception of dignity is part of the rules of the democratic game. And, and that means that, that perhaps eternity clauses that, that protect that richer conception of dignity um, should be regarded as democratically legitimate. Um, and, and as enforceable by a constitutional court. Um, but again, I think Kelsen would have, would have worried that, and perhaps it's a tension in his view that, that he didn't really resolve. So perhaps it is, uh, perhaps there is a tension between his advocacy for um, constitutional review and his understanding of democracy. But I think the worry that he would have had is that if you adopt the Swakinian understanding of the content of the rules of the democratic game, that includes its material conception of dignity or equal concern and respect, then there's a danger that the constitutional court will just restrict the openness of the democratic process too much. That there will be too many decisions that can't be taken even with the support of a majority of the populace. And, and that is something that Kelsen would find troubling. You don't find troubling here in Brazil because we have this kind of extension restriction of the political uh, arena based on, yeah. on law, based on arguments yeah. from law and some very debatable because they are in the, in the texture of the, the bigness of the, mm -hmm. of, the, of the texture and or uh, over inclusiveness and uh, he will be very troubled with Brazil, I think. Pode depois o Carlos usual. So I actually have one question about the uh, sort of work at Kelsen in the sense that uh, uh, you present a view of Kelsen. Nice out. Uh, 
I get a lot of Portuguese in there. <laughs> but uh, you present the Bill of Tales, and that mix, that mix seems to be sort of a uh, process view of democracy, and mm -hmm. not a uh, view that uh, constitutional courts should uh, enforce rights in the sense of working such as rights as terms. And uh, you sort of answer that, whatever, you want to come and see more, how do you do that? And my second question is um, that uh, you expose the theory of democracy of Kelsen, and uh, it's usually, we usually have here present today the, the, the two theories of law. And uh, one of the views that one can hold is that the theory of democracy of Kelsen, Kelsen's theory of democracy, and Kelsen's true theory of law are, in some sense, completely separate. But Kelsen himself seems in his writings to try to uh, make uh, these two theories compatible in some way. And uh, he seems to do that uh, based on the idea of philosophical relativity. So if you could get a comment on your views, if this approach of Kelsen is feasible, or if really the theory of democracy and the true theory of law are two very uh, actually, things, two separate things. Uh, this would be good. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I, th I think you're right to say that, that Kelsen is, is perhaps, could be understood as a kind of forerunner of, of a process based understanding of democracy. And so I think there's an American um, author whose views are very close to Kelsen, it's John Hart Ely, who, who wrote a book, I think it's called Democracy and Distrust. Trust. Uh, in which he develops um, a view of, of the role of a constitutional court, which I think is, is quite in the spirit of, of Kelsen, um, where, where the idea is that um, a constitutional court is supposed to protect people's democratic rights in cases where the democratic process itself isn't able to do that. And, and he puts a lot of emphasis in his book on the idea that there are some minorities, which he calls insular minorities, that, that will, will never have the opportunity to become part of a winning political coalition. And the claim is that um, it's, it's uh, the, the job of the court to look after these um, insular minorities and, and to protect their rights um, against laws that might compromise them. And so Kelsen actually says something very similar, um, th though the background is different. So of course, in the US background, um, 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 the, the, the minorities are racial minorities. Um, so Kelsen himself thinks about national minorities, I think coming out of this Austro-Hungarian multinational context. And he argues that if, if there are national minorities in a nation state, then of course the constitution must protect their rights against the, the majority. And um, to do that, uh, a constitutional court is necessary to enforce those rights. Um, so, so I think there, there's really a, a very clear parallel. And I, I agree with that suggestion. Um, so to Dworkin. <laughs> Um, so of course Dworkin, um, so he wrote a very, very um, um, vicious review of this book by John Hart, I think, and it's in, in which he argues that, oh well, but democracy has a moral basis, and the moral basis is that um, we, we give everyone equal dignity. That's the reason why we think that everyone must have a vote, but there's also a reason to think that there must be a right to abortion or whatever other rights perhaps are, are required in Dworkin's view by uh, a material conception of human dignity. So he thinks that the separation, sorry, the justification of democracy cannot be separated from the justification for um, these material aspects of human dignity. Um, and uh, if, if democracy is based on human dignity, then um, the democratic process must be protected, but so must be the material rights that flow from um, a substantive conception of dignity. And I think the difference between Kelsen and Dworkin is that, that Kelsen does not go along with this expansion of the, the rules of the game of democracy. And so whether, whether there is a principled reason to not to accept Dworkin's extension of the rules of the democratic game, I guess is a, a difficult question. But perhaps Kelsen could, Kelsen could try to draw for support on, on some of the ideas we find in Jeremy Waldron, um, who, who we will discuss in the last lecture, who argues that well, I mean, even if, if we agree that there is a more interesting conception of human dignity that doesn't, uh, isn't fully captured in a procedural version of democracy, we will always disagree about what um, this, this conception of dignity requires. Um, and it's 
unfair from a democratic point of view to have such disagreements decided by a court. It's fairer, it's more democratic to have them decided by a legislature. And so perhaps Kelsen could, could embrace an argument of that sort um, and use it not to reject the legitimacy of constitutional review as Waldron does, but to use it um, to argue for a more restricted understanding of um, the value of democracy than we find in Waldron. Um, so about the, the relationship between the pure theory of, yeah. So I think Kelsen would say that the pure theory of law as a legal theory has nothing to do with the, his political theory or his theory of democracy. So that is his official view. Um, so the idea would be that you could be um, a fascist or, or a fervent defender of some authoritarian ideology. Um, you should still acknowledge that the pure theory of law is the correct theory of the structure of a legal system, of any legal system, whether it's democratic or not democratic. Um, and so the, the preference, the normative preference for democracy that Kelsen himself, of course, um, held on to, um, it, it does n has nothing to do with, in his view, with his arguments for the pure theory of law. Um, now, if, if we start from the other side, if we start from the, the, the um, advocacy for democracy, I think we get a slightly different picture. So I think Kelsen would say that in order to understand how democracy works, in order to understand how um, a constitution works, um, and why there ought to be a judicial guardian of the constitution, we have to rely on the description of legal order uh, or of the structure of legal system that is given to us by the pure theory of law. So we will see tomorrow that um, the argument for judicial guardianship makes quite heavy use of the idea of um, the legal system as a hierarchy of norms. And I think without that background idea taken from the PTL, um, his argument for constitutional review wouldn't, wouldn't really work. So the political theory is partly dependent on the legal theory, I guess, but not the other way around. Uh, I think Professor Lenz has almost completely answered my question, but I'll try to rephrase it. Uh, I think all these conceptions of these fundamental rights, uh, the concept that fundamental rights should be protected by the Constitution in a counter-majoritarian way, uh, comes mostly, at least in civil law culture, after World War II. I think German constitutional court uh, would be the maximum symbol of this with Conrad Adenauer. And, uh, my question specifically is how does Kelsen, if he does, and maybe you will talk about it more precisely tomorrow, how does Kelsen uh, deals with the so-called counter-majoritarian difficulty in country? <laughs> yeah. uh, because in, uh, in one of his responses to Schmidt, Schmidt argues that the constitutional court is not democratic, and, and Kelsen says, well, Schmidt's just ignoring what happened in Austria, because in Austria mm -hmm. the constitutional court is composed in a democratic way, just like happened in Germany nowadays. Uh, somehow, uh, so he he's concerned with the democratic legi legitimacy of the constitutional court. Mm. How does he align this with the idea, if he does, uh, the ideas of fundamental rights uh, being protected in a counter-majoritarian way by the Supreme Court? Uh, because I'm not sure if Kelsen wrote anything after mm. specifically mm. about constitutional review yes. after World War II. I'm not sure he did. Yeah. Uh, if he did, if you could uh, yes. specifically go into that. Yes. Yeah, so, so, um, in, so in the passage that you reference in, in Schmidt, so he says that, well, if, if um, disagreements about, about the meaning of the Constitution were to be decided by a constitutional court, then highly political decisions would be given over to an aristocracy of the robe, I think is um, the term that Schmidt uses. Um, and then Kelsen replies to this, as you point out, by saying, oh, well, um, but 
it's conceivable, it's possible at least, uh, to have a constitutional court where the judges are elected, right? And I mean, the way that I interpret this passage um, is that perhaps what he has in mind isn't merely the possibility that judges could be appointed by a parliament um, in, in some way that includes different factions and so on. Um, what he has in mind, I think, is that judges could just be elected by the people um, the way that it's happening in Mexico now, apparently, or the way it's done in some places in the US. Uh, and so, so this is his re reply. So there's no, there's no, uh, nothing that, that stops us from creating an institution that functions as a constitutional tribunal, but that has popularly elected um, judges sitting on it. But I think that even if you grant that this is possible, and I mean, clearly it is possible because there are places where it is done, um, it doesn't solve the, the counter-majoritarian difficulty because, I mean, whoever is elected to this tribunal, um, it will still be the case that you have a handful of people sitting in this tribunal and they will decide for everyone else and, and they may take decisions that, are, um, that don't reflect the views, the wishes of the majority of the people. I mean, perhaps it's quite likely that they will because, of course, they will be subject to all kinds of influence once they are in, in their positions. And, um, and so, so in a sense, uh, the fact that the decision takers who take these autocratic decisions or counter-majoritarian decisions are democratically elected doesn't make the decision itself any less counter-majoritarian. So, so I think if he has a solution to the counter-majoritarian difficulty, that argument um, can't be it. And so I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, what, what I think his real argument for trying to address the counter-majoritarian difficulty is in, in tomorrow's lecture. Carlos. Carlos, por favor. Hello. Um, I would like to ask you about uh, the role of Rousseau in theory of uh, democracy. Because uh, uh, it, it seems it might be one of the reasons why it was not picked up in the United States or Yeah, so thank you very much for, for, for both of these uh, remarks. So I think that this must be true that, that Rousseau, um, as a background, ha would have made the theory less interesting to, to an American audience or less plausible. Um, and, and though Kelsen, of course, though he tries to weaken Rousseau's conception, I think he's, he's quite deeply committed to one key idea in Rousseau, namely that democracy is about who makes the laws. And so um, 
it's, it's quite difficult, for, for instance, to, to even fit a, a presidentialist system of government as it exists in the US into this Rousseauian framework. And, and I think that that must be one of the reasons why, why um, Kelsen's theory, given that it was indebted to Rousseau, wasn't, um, wasn't as popular in, in the Anglo-American context as perhaps uh, it, it might have been. So it's interesting to see if one looks at these democratic theorists in the German language area in, in the period after the First World War, that so they're, they're suddenly faced with this challenge to think about democracy because the, the monarchic systems were toppled in, in the Great War. Um, and, and they have to invent a democratic constitutional theory. And, and if you consider where, where, where they're looking to, they're not looking to the US very much. Um, they, they are looking to the UK, they're looking to France, to Switzerland, and to authors like Rousseau. And, and, and their way of thinking about democracy is sort of very European. And, and there's a, um, a tradition of democratic thought, I think, that, that could have developed here if, if it hadn't been interrupted by, by the Nazis and, and uh, uh, turned into something much more uh, American-centric, I guess. Um, and, and about Kelsen, yes, so, so I think that um, Perhaps Kelsen was also then misunderstood, or his legal theory was misunderstood if it was taken to be a theory of order, because of course Kelsen would have combined his claim that the pure theory is um, non-evaluative with um, the view that, yeah, with, with, with the view that um, the law doesn't um, carry any intrinsic moral obligatoriness with it. So. Um, I suppose if, if you're an adherent of the PTL, you can, you can be an anarchist and you should perhaps deny that the law is um, intrinsically obligatory. And it seems to me that the, the employment of, of the view as a, as a force of order would likely have been based on a misinterpretation that took the law to be binding no matter what, what its content was. But that is not what, what Kelsen wants to argue. <coughs> Could you hear the answer, Carlos? Because the internet is yeah, yeah, yeah. very bad. Yeah, I think it's paralyzed. Uh -huh. Thank you. Rafael. Yeah. Ah, Carlos. Thank you. Rafael. So yeah, perhaps one, one response to give is that I don't think Kelsen, um, or in the view that I attribute to Kelsen, perhaps I should say, um, a dictatorship could never be legitimate. So, so a legitimate um, political system is a political system where this question that I presented with the quote, so this question, how can these people have the right to rule over me given that we are all equal? So a legitimate political system is a system in which that question has an answer. but. In, in an autocracy or a dictatorship, that question doesn't have an answer because what happens in that system is that some people rule and other people have to obey, and that's it. You know? And the democracy is supposed to um, integrate the people who are who are expected to obey in at least in some extended virtual sense um, among those who are making the laws, and that's what makes it different and potentially legitimate. And so I think um, he, he would have to argue that such a system, perhaps it, it may be that we need it because no other system is available, but, but um, this question of legitimacy doesn't then have an answer in the dictator. So how do we know um, a democracy has, has failed? Well, it's, it's difficult, right? So um, consider the recent US election. Um, and I guess there, there was the question that, of course, has become irrelevant by the way it, it, it went in the end, but. Uh, before the election, people might have asked themselves, so what's going to happen if uh, Trump loses the election? So is he going to accept defeat? Um, or is he going to claim that, um, that there was some kind of flaw or, or a manipulation of the vote and then try to hang on in some way through political pressure? And it seems to me that if, if you have to expect that one of the two political camps will act in that way in case it loses an election, then 
<laughs> perhaps you can't really be so sure that democracy still exists because it must be built on the trust that unites people across the divide that they will all um, respect the outcomes of elections. And of course, also perhaps abide by decisions taken by courts that act as constitutional guardians. And so it seems to me that um, if, if you can no longer have trust, um, that, that players will act that way, then, then you have to begin to wonder whether democracy might be under threat. Yes, so, so I, yeah, that, I think um, uh, I'm, I'm quite grateful for that question because I should admit that um, perhaps I, I wish he'd never said these things about homogeneity. <laughs> and and so, so in a way, perhaps um, it, it would have been easier for me if, if he had never come up with that claim to, to make my case for, for my interpretation of, of Kelsen's um, theory of democracy. So, I mean, in one sense, of course, you're right to say that um, that in a way he's wrong in this claim that there can't be democracy in, in ethnic or linguistic or religious diversity. I mean, so one, one very obvious counterexample for this is India, which is a democracy and which is multilingual, multi-ethnic, um, which, which has a fairly serious religious divide between Hindus and Muslims. And so still it's a democracy. I mean, perhaps it is threatened, arguably, but I mean, it's, it's survived for quite some time um, and, and certainly functioned well in, in some periods of its history. So, so the, the claim that um, there must be national homogeneity for a democracy to exist is empirically false. It's not, it's not as simple as that. Um, so, so perhaps what Kelsen should have said is simply that as a matter of fact, it may be that the people who are to live together in a state will, will find themselves in such deep political conflict for whatever reason that um, they're no longer willing to, to accept um, democratic decision taking and they will try to get the upper hand by violent means. And, and of course that, that, that is a, a factual possibility. Um, and perhaps it's useful for um, politicians or for, for, for uh, institutional designers to think about that possibility in, in designing institutions. Um, and, and perhaps to design institutions in such a way that this event is put off through using institutional devices that, that make a more diverse society work without domination of smaller groups by larger groups. Um, so perhaps that's what he should have said. And I think that the main, um, the, the main difference that I see to Schmidt is that, um, so in Schmidt's view, there, there is this idea that um, these requirements of homogeneity, they have a legal relevance. So for example, they, they determine what the limits of constitutional amendment are, for instance, even in a constitution where there are no eternity clauses. And I think Kelsen is clearly opposed to the idea that this condition of homogeneity is, is legally relevant. So I think he sees it just as a, as a factual condition of sufficient social stability. And, and there is no, no legal agent, whether it's um, a court or the head of the executive that can decide what the limits of democracy are or what, what degree of diversity is compatible with democracy. So really, 
You just have to try how far you get with it. Mais alguém? Mais alguém? Uh, no. So thank you, Lars and everyone. And tomorrow we will have uh, a big debate between